Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Roger Morton. I'm Managing Director for Innovation at European Metal Recycling. Great to see so many people on the call today uh, and uh, really looking forward to an interesting discussion. This is the first in our webinar series about how EMR is approaching uh, net zero and, and our campaign for improving our sustainability. And today's session has a focus on logistics. That's one of the biggest carbon impacts in our operations. So it's one of our areas of focus. Uh, with me today, I've got uh, three experts uh, in the field of, uh, within the EMR. Uh, it's Ian Shepherd, David Shepherd, who's joining us from Hong Kong, and Simon Wood. Uh, I've asked them briefly to introduce themselves in a minute, and then we'll have video presentations from each of them uh, explaining that how they're approaching sustainability in their part of the business. At the end of that, there's an opportunity for, for me to ask them to uh, answer your questions. So it would be great if you could uh, put your questions in the comment bar on the right-hand side, or it should be on the right-hand side of your screen, during the presentation or any time during the session today, uh, the more the area, whatever you fancy, to, fancy asking us, and then I'll put those questions to the panelists. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'll ask Ian to introduce himself first. Thank you, Roger. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name's Ian Shepherd. I'm the Managing Director over responsible for 70 UK locations. Thanks very much, Ian. And then I'll move to, uh, to David in, uh, in Hong Kong. Thanks, Roger. Uh, my name is David Shepherd. I'm the Ferris Commercial Director for EMR. So I'm uh, largely involved in the uh, export sales of Ferris scrap. Uh, and as a result of that, also heavily involved in the logistics of moving scrap, deep sea and short sea. So we're a family company and uh, we've got two of the, uh, the family members on the call today. So it shows how seriously uh, we're taking this, this topic. And our final speaker is uh, to the final panelist today is Simon Wood. Would you like to introduce yourself, Simon? Yes, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Simon Wood. I'm the UK Logistics Director, and I'm responsible for the movements of our materials by road and by rail in the UK and looking for opportunities to improve sustainable performance. So, thanks very much, guys. Uh, it's, uh, we, we move millions of tons of stuff all over the world, short sea, deep sea, by road, by rail. It's a really big part of our operations and it's a really big part of our carbon impact. Uh, I'll hand over now to uh, Ian. You're going to do the first uh, video presentation to, uh, to take us through uh, our overall approach and then uh, the other guys will follow with their bits of the business. Uh, while that's going on, I'd like to remind you, if you could put your questions into the comment bar uh, we'll put those, we'll see those coming through and we'll put them to the panelists at the end of the session, which will be about uh, 20 minutes from now. So thanks very much. Hello. It's never been more important to focus on managing our impact on the environment and at EMR we're focusing hard on improving our performance and we want to support people and businesses to also be more sustainable. It's essential that we all play our part in decarbonisation as it's key to driving the green recovery of the global economy and reversing the impact of climate change. So I'd like to talk to you about our exciting plans for decarbonisation which we call our Decade of Action. I'll also explain the measures we're taking to become carbon net zero by 2030 on indirect emissions generated through our energy providers and share 
how we'll reach a target of carbon net zero by 2040 on all direct emissions upstream and downstream in the value chain. Our sustainability strategy is built around four pillars, energy productivity, renewable electricity, movement of people and material handling and movement. To drive progress in these areas, we've joined three key initiatives established by internationally respected non-profit organisation, The Climate Group. EP100 to improve energy productivity, RE100 to accelerate transition to renewables, and EV100 to switch to electric vehicles. There are a number of key areas of focus in our energy productivity programme. We're making good progress on determining our baseline energy consumption, including electrical energy, diesel, gas oil, petroleum and LPG. In order to measure and improve our productivity, an energy management system is being developed to roll out across the business. All sites will have energy efficiency targets and regular audits. And all colleagues will have access to a training programme to learn about the efficient use of energy. We've made some great progress already in educating our colleagues in lean techniques and how to achieve more productivity with less energy consumption. We've already started our replacement program for any equipment that doesn't meet our energy efficiency standards. And we've also been making best use of advancing technologies. And a great example of this is a recent investment in power inverter technology. That investment has proven a 20% increase in power efficiency on our 6,000 horsepower shredder in London, which has very high electricity consumption. So in summary, by 2023, 30% of our sites will have the energy management system implemented and we will have demonstrated an improvement in energy consumption per tonne of material handled from our 2020 baseline. And by 2030, we'll have achieved 100% implementation and 10% improvement in consumption. The next pillar in our decade of action is renewable energy. There are a number of ways we'll transition to renewable energy. We're influencing electricity procurement from third party suppliers. And I'm pleased to say we're already well ahead of target at 85% in the UK. In the USA, it is more challenging, but we're working on it. There are ongoing feasibility studies to explore implementing our own renewable electricity generation. And where this is not feasible, we'll work with suppliers to purchase electricity from renewable sources, and we're working hard to identify and commit to renewable electricity wherever possible to support greening of the grid. We're also determined to remain progressive and continually review our strategy in line with economic and technological change. To summarise, by 2023, 30% of our electricity purchases will be from renewable sources, and this will rise to 60% by 2026 and 100% by 2030. Now we come to the movement of people. We've started by reviewing the transport needs of the business. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed both the way we work and how we communicate. So we've worked hard to embrace remote working and digital communication to cut down on unnecessary journeys. We're developing a group-wide sustainable transport policy which covers limited, unavoidable travel. We've also reviewed our vehicle procurement and leasing arrangements and have now started our transition to low-carbon vehicles. Finally, a group-wide electric charging infrastructure is also in the planning stages. So, to summarise, by 2023, 30% of our cars and light commercial vehicles will transition to electric power and 10% of our heavy goods vehicles will also transition. By 2030, this will include 100% of cars and light vehicles and 50% of heavy goods vehicles. Worldwide, EMR handles around 10 million tonnes of material on its journey to be recycled. And this requires a significant amount of plant vehicles and vessels to move this material across a vast network. I'd like to now talk you through our plans to minimise our carbon footprint in the handling and movement of this material. We started a review of all plant and equipment to evaluate how the business can operate in an even more efficient and environmentally responsible way. One of the key areas we're focused on is electric and low carbon alternatives for mobile plants. We've already made several fully electric installations and when purchasing our largest material handling plant, we've chosen hybrid options that are enabled for full electrification. 
Heavy goods vehicle procurement and leasing arrangements are being reviewed and we're working with our suppliers of road, rail and sea freight services to advance low carbon freight. And as previously mentioned, we will continue to educate our colleagues in energy efficiency and lean techniques so they can do more with less. I feel it's really important to show our teams how they are performing on a day-to-day -day basis so we can keep that momentum going. So in summary, 5% of new material handling equipment and heavy goods vehicles will be powered by electrical, hybrid, fuel cell or biofuel sources by 2023. And this will rise to 20% by 2030. Thank you for listening. Now, over to my colleagues David and Simon, who are going to look closer at how our logistics team are reducing their carbon output. EMR's goal is to be a progressive, industry-leading metal recycler. And to achieve this, we must have a world-class logistics function. As logistics director, I know that the only way for a business like ours to be world class in 2021 is by tackling our emissions, protecting biodiversity and becoming a truly sustainable business. As you've heard from Ian, every part of our business is working towards this goal via a single strategy called Our Decade of Action, which sets out the specific achievable actions that EMR will take over the next 10 years to get us started on our journey to become a net zero business by 2040. A key commitment in this strategy is for EMR to transition away from fossil fuels wherever possible by 2030. For a business like EMR, which has used the UK road network to collect and deliver scrap for more than half a century, this is a massive step for us to take. It means not only rethinking the way we use our road transport, but also thinking hard about what role other modes of transport, such as rail and marine, can play for us going forward. Sustainability can mean many things to different people, and sometimes that can lead to some confused language and targets that sound good in theory, but actually mean little in practice. So firstly, I think it's important for me to define what EMR means when it pledges to transition away from fossil fuels, wherever possible, over the next decade. From the beginning of our sustainability journey, EMR has been clear about one thing, that our decade of action strategy will provide deliverable and measurable targets that allow our teams to get to work on making EMR a more sustainable business. This all the while gives our customers the confidence that when we say we're getting ready for a greener, cleaner future, we actually mean it. So our move away from fossil fuel powered road transport is in line with the targets laid out in the Climate Group's EV100 initiative. The Climate Group's target is to make electric transport the new norm by 2030. EMR signed up for this as part of our efforts to decarbonise the movement of people in our business. Our decade of action provides a pathway to this goal. Our targets include switching 30% of cars and light commercial vehicles and 10% of small HGVs to electric or hydrogen run equivalents by 2023. That's just the start. By 2026, EMR aims to have 60% of our cars and light commercial fleet and 30% of our small HGVs running on net zero technology. Our commitment is then to hit 100% use of electric vehicles or equivalent low carbon transport for all cars and light commercial vehicles and 50% of small HGVs by the end of the decade. Along the way, our targets mean that our customers, employees and policymakers can hold us to account on our progress. And it's a challenge we embrace. Though ambitious, this goal takes account of what's currently possible in terms of technology and it means that by 2030, all the people and a significant part of the material that EMR moves on Britain's roads will have been decarbonised. However, even this is just the beginning. If EMR is to cut all of the carbon emissions it produces while moving materials on our roads, which is 15% of the company's total emissions, then we will need to transition to greener, cleaner technology for our articulated trucks 
and other larger HGVs too. These are the vehicles that transport loads of up to 25 tonnes of steel, iron or aluminium around the country. For context, that's the equivalent weight of more than four fully grown African elephants. I'll be honest, decarbonising this part of our logistics simply isn't possible yet. Today's electric vehicles do not have enough power to propel a truck laden with scrap metal. Similarly, emerging hydrogen powered vehicle technologies are not yet ready to make the conventional combustion engine a thing of the past. At EMR, we do not see this as an excuse to sit back and wait for vehicle manufacturers to innovate until this problem is solved. Instead, the ethos of our decade of action strategy is to get to work wherever possible to improve our hardware and our processes, delivering whatever cuts in emissions we can right now. Part of this is set out in our commitment to the EV100 initiative and the progress we've already made in electrification of our fleet of cars and light vehicles where the technology does in fact exist. Our highly trained team of HGV drivers also have a massive contribution to make. By working together with our operations and sustainability experts, EMR's drivers are finding ways to make each journey more efficient. This can be by cutting idling and hard acceleration during the journeys, using the latest mapping technology to ensure every route is as efficiently planned as possible, or simply making sure our fleet is well maintained, extending each vehicle's life to its maximum length. All of these elements can have a major impact on the carbon emissions EMR produces while moving our materials by road. But as we look towards the second decade of our journey to net zero, finding totally decarbonised ways to transport our material around the UK will be absolutely essential. Here EMR is fortunate in that many of our recycling sites have rail or water transport connections. Increasingly, we're transferring more of our material movements from road to rail or water transport. My colleague David will discuss some of the advantages EMR can gain by transporting more material on water. First, I'd like to explain to you why our use of rail offers such a great example of some of the benefits that decarbonising our operations can bring. To fully understand the opportunities that rail can provide, it's important to understand the significant role it already provides in our business today. Here in the UK, EMR works closely with our rail freight partners to move materials to our deep sea docks as well as to customers wherever possible. We're using two sets of railway wagons that are known as MBAs or Monster Boxes. Each set includes 18 wagons with individual capacity of 84 cubic metres and a potential payload of 72 tonnes. In practice, this means that each train EMR runs has a carrying capacity of around 1,300 tonnes. To continue the comparison, that's more like 217 elephants. Moving the same amount of material by road would take 52 trucks. The advantages of moving that much material by rail instead of by road is huge. Loading one single train instead of a lorry means less traffic on our roads, less congestion on our sites and frees up our waybridges to provide faster service for customers who deliver their scrap into us. We run these trains six to seven times per week from sites such as Sheffield, Birmingham, Swindon into our Liverpool dock site for onward shipping around the world. Rail connected customers can also have material delivered directly to their operations which isn't just better for the environment, it's both more efficient and more cost effective for them and of course for EMR. All while delivering a significant and measurable reduction in carbon emissions for our business and for theirs. Our rail service partner provides regular sustainability reports. It has calculated that all rail freight in the UK avoided approximately 7 million HGV journeys through 2018 to 2019. The carbon footprint of rail freight is significantly less than road and our partner suggests EMR is saving around 8,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions thanks to the use of its rail facilities. Unsurprisingly then, this is an area of our UK operations we're keen to invest in further. EMR is increasing the number of trains it will operate in the future to up to nine per week. That means a further reduction in our road use 
and will help us to move yet closer to our ultimate aims of net zero carbon impact. And because of these benefits, it's an area we're investing in globally. Our latest shredder site in Becker, Minnesota, includes a new $2.5 million rail line to enable our American colleagues to load wagons for distribution across the whole country, again cutting the number of trucks needed to transfer material over long distances. While moving more material by rail makes sense for EMR, it's important to note that rail is not yet a fully net zero method of transport either. As technology progresses in the years ahead, we hope that the arrival of hydrogen-powered trains and a decarbonised electricity supply for our rail networks will ensure that by 2040 our use of rail is entirely carbon neutral. As EMR looks to make changes to the way it operates on that path in the coming years, it's clear that this centuries-old method of transport will have a, a major role in our sustainable net zero future. And I'll now pass you on to my colleague David to explain more about what we're doing to utilise the sustainability benefits of marine transport. Thanks, Simon. I'd like to start with the good news about EMR's use of marine transport. As a low friction, high volume method of moving material, a ship beats road transport every time. Around the UK, we operate many dock facilities, including Liverpool, Tilbury, and a huge new site about to open in Glasgow. This allows us to move our material between our locations in the UK, to our customs in Europe, and further overseas, with far less emissions than using current road or rail transport. You might be thinking, why ship material halfway around the world in the first place? Surely we can find a use for our ferrous and non-ferrous metals right here at home. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. As it stands, the UK economy just doesn't have the capacity to reuse and recycle the huge quantities of metal that EMR processes each year. As Ferris Commercial Director at EMR, I have a great vantage point to see which markets are doing the most to process and recycle metal and other materials most efficiently and sustainably. The difficult truth is that right now that's rarely the UK. For our products, from iron and steel to aluminium, copper and plastic, to play their vital role in replacing the use of virgin material in the next generation of infrastructure or consumer goods, EMR must ensure it reaches the right global markets. And in recent years, this is an area in which we've made substantial investments right across the world, because moving material on water is, per mile, more efficient than other modes of transport. In fact, EMR's US division invested around $14 million to install a dock site at our Eastern Division in Brayton Point, Massachusetts, so operations could move material on water by barge. And on the doorstep of COP26 at our brand new 11.5 acre Glasgow dock site, we're building the most advanced deep sea dock for the export of scrap anywhere in the UK. Not only will this bring some of the world's biggest ships back onto the Clyde, but per tonne of steel carried, these bulk cargo carriers are also responsible for just a fifth of the emissions compared to our smaller vessels. Yet, although transport by ship is much more efficient in terms of carbon impact than road haulage or even rail, we have to confront the fact that modern shipping is still a significant contributor to global carbon emissions. In fact, at EMR, it represents 39% of our total emissions. Unfortunately, right now we cannot invest in clean net zero shipping technology for one simple reason, it doesn't yet exist. We have committed to reaching net zero by 2040 with an understanding that in some areas such as shipping there is still a lot of work to do. It will take our transport partners time to explore and innovate different methods of propulsion so that shipping can become net zero. Despite these challenges, there's a lot we can do now to reduce our carbon emissions from shipping. On one level, this is about investing in modern electrified equipment such as hybrid cranes that ensure shiploading happens in a sustainable and efficient way. There are also a lot of incremental changes EMR can make today, which will, when added together, 
provide a substantial reduction to the impact of our shipping operations. On a more fundamental level, EMR is working closely with UK metal producers and heavy industry to increase the volume of recycled metal that they can use within the UK, avoiding the need for material to be exported in the first place. This is a long-term goal, but if EMR can deliver the right grade and purity of material that UK manufacturers require, and as previously mentioned, they are able to scale up their volumes to use more of our materials, there is an opportunity to create a circular economy much closer to home. To make this happen, EMR is building closer supply chain relationships. Projects such as Ricovas, which focuses on building a UK supply chain for the recycling and reuse of electric car batteries, is bringing together the UK's biggest manufacturers, academia and EMR, to put in place the foundations of a circular economy that keeps valuable battery materials within our shores. We are also looking to develop the same sort of collaboration with the UK steel supply chain. One of the benefits of being a privately owned family business is that EMR can make long-term investments and this is invaluable when it comes to the drive to make our business more sustainable. Right now we don't have all the answers when it comes to decarbonising our shipping use and the same goes for rail and road transport too. Each of these alternative options comes with its own net zero challenges. There is however intense pressure from across the economy for better, more sustainable solutions to the country's freight transport needs. Our partners know the sector that manages to reach the goal of net zero freight transport first will have a huge advantage and will, to a large extent, dictate our strategy in the decades ahead. Until that point, EMR is working hard with our team, our customers and climate scientists to find real world ways to reduce the carbon impact of our logistics today. Thanks very much to uh, Ian, Simon and David there for uh, taking us through our strategy on how to decarbonise our logistics operations. And thanks everyone for putting too many questions through as well. And, and please feel free to put more questions uh, on the comment field if anything else comes up in, in the discussion now. Uh, we've had quite a lot of questions already. Um, so um, just one for, for um, Ian initially. Um, do you plan on having electric cranes at all of your shiploading sites? Um, certainly that's the long-term plan, Roger. Um, it's quite challenging in our industry uh, because a lot of the mobile plant needs to travel between heaps. Um, so our first step is to make, was to make sure that um, any new purchases that we're making are e-enabled effectively. So they are hybrid handlers. Um, we're currently looking at uh, a feasibility study to see how we can effectively dock these cranes at electrical points at the locations. Um, that's quite challenging given the nature of what we do with falling, uh, falling scrap from the grabs, etc., and be able to protect the cabling. So that's quite challenging. But where we've got static, um, mobile, where we've got mobile plant that's more static, um, we're looking at buying pedestal cranes that are hardwired in. Um, and we've already made a number of purchases there to feed our large static plants. I'm really excited about that. Um, the other area of progress we're making is around small mobile plants, so forklift trucks. And there's already trucks available. And we've just made two purchases in recent days for lithium-powered uh, forklift trucks as well. So we're making some progress on there, but it's it's quite challenging given given what we do. Thanks very much, Ian. And that's uh, really quite uh, radical stuff, putting uh, static uh, electric plants uh, in, into our sort of environment. So it's really interesting to see how that develops, and hopefully it will stimulate some of the manufacturers to come up with some innovations too, when they see that uh, a big firm like EMR is demanding those changes. Um, 
There's lots of other questions. Um, question for David. Uh, are there any signs that uh, clean shipping will be available in the, within the next decade, or what do you see as the, the likely uh, time scale for new uh, zero or low carbon shipping technologies to come available? Um, I think that, you know, the most recent uh, development has been to move away from um, high sulfur fuels. And so, you know, that was the, the most recent investment by the shipping industry. And they've um, spent a lot of money putting uh, scrubbers in all the ships to meet a new requirement of emissions. Going forward, obviously, electrification, I think, just like with automobiles, it, it, is going to be happening in ships. And I think, you know, the biggest challenge, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert, but the biggest challenge is, is going to be the the, the, uh, the the power of the battery and the longevity of the, the battery power for such long journeys. Um, but I know that there's a Norwegian company that's already uh, looking to make sea trials this year for the what's reported to be the first um, electrified cargo ship. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that that's where we're heading. And with the technology um, for developing for batteries now, particularly moving away from lithium to sodium, where there's you know um, more longevity uh, available, then I, I think we'll definitely get there for electrification of, of, of cargo ships in the future. I've not heard much discussion of it, but I'd be quite excited to see a return to uh, sail transportation as well. And, uh, Maybe the days of the clipper ships, but perhaps I'm being a bit uh, optimistic there. Um, another question, quite on a quite a different topic, is um, maybe maybe one for Simon. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that the current driver shortages in the UK might uh, accelerate the transition to other forms of transport? Yeah, certainly it would be one of the driving factors. But please remember that the driver shortage in the UK isn't a new phenomenon. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were dealing with something like a shortage of 60,000 drivers in the UK, and arguably that's now increased to something like 90,000 drivers. So we are seeing at last some interventions by government, for example, to try and uh, improve the speed of drivers getting through tests and to um, allow um, visas for drivers to come into the country to take a bit of pressure off with even the army in the background to call in to, uh, to help support the, the road networks. But of course, that is continuing to make um, road hauliers look for alternative means of transport and for those moving their goods. And we've also seen a bit of decline in passenger numbers on the rail. And of course, over the last few years, the need to move coal by rail has diminished. So there is capacity, no doubt, within rail networks to take on and handle more materials. But like all things with rail, these things tend to be slow. Um, it may require the construction of hubs with first mile and last mile delivery of materials to those hubs. But certainly we'd welcome an increase in rail traffic, um, partly because it would uh, take pressure off the, the current shortage of drivers. And remember, one train is equivalent to something like 70 to 80 trucks, uh, a significant number of elephants. So um, we would definitely welcome that and want to see that in the future. Great. Thanks very much, Simon. And maybe another one for you. Uh, there's a couple of related questions, actually. One saying, um, when do you expect to see electric and hydrogen powered vehicles really seriously entering service in the EMR fleet, particularly on HGVs? And uh, more, more of a suggestion almost from uh, one of our audience saying, do you think that uh, some of the EMR's factory contracts are great, good places to test the introduction of electric HGVs? Because those vehicles move, tend to move quite small distances at a time. Yeah, so a couple of really good key points in the question there. One is that we need to look across the suite of vehicles that we operate, and that's everything from company cars to the, the heaviest 44,000 kilo goods vehicles, and devise a strategy to decarbonize um, those elements of the fleet. Now, starting with the smaller vehicles, the cars and the vans, and the lighter heavy goods vehicles up to seven and a half tons, there is some uh, available technology today that will allow us um, to combine that with our replacement program so that we can hit the targets that I stated in my, my earlier presentation. So we see that as being part of the current business strategy and we will deliver against those goals. Where it's much more challenging for us is the heavy goods vehicles, the 44,000 kilo vehicles, because you can imagine that a battery pack 
to produce sufficient power to run one of those vehicles would be extremely heavy and would impact greatly on overall vehicle efficiency. So the actual payload we could carry on the truck would be diminished significantly. And then the overall um, footprint and performance of the vehicle would be detrimentally affected in terms of its productivity and energy performance. So we're in a bit of a wait and see stage at the moment. Um, it's not to say that we're standing still. There are things that we can do. So our latest order for um, tipping trailers, for example, um, we've, with the manufacturer, looking to re-engineer those to take out weight to increase capacity and improve the energy productivity of those trucks. And we're talking closely to vehicle manufacturers about when technology may be available that we can use to decarbonize. And in fact, we've actually got a vehicle running in um, Holland at the moment, in the Netherlands, which is running on CNG um, with an equivalent reduction in emissions. And we've similarly tried um, CNG powered heavy goods vehicles in the UK. Um, but we're a bit behind the curve in terms of the distribution network of the fuels. So again, that's something that we're monitoring and uh, willing to embrace as and when both the technology and refueling stations become available to us. So can I just check it? CNG, that's compressed natural gas, is that? Correct, that's right, Roger, yes. And, and uh, do you think also potentially that uh, hydrogen fuel cells or biofuels is a solution for the HGVs? Yes, market? absolutely. I think hydrogen-powered fuels is, are showing a certain amount of promise, and we understand that from some of the manufacturers that during 2023 uh, there will be consumer trials of larger goods vehicles powered by hydrogen, so that's certainly something we're showing great interest in too. Great stuff. Um, a couple of other questions that we've, we've had coming in, uh, more relating to the, uh, to the use of our uh, passenger vehicles. Um, how confident is the panel that the range and the time taken to charge electric vehicles will be, will be viable for, for people to work properly? What, what's your view on that, Simon? I think, again, people will have to look at their particular requirements and the distances they travel. So a bit like our heavy goods fleet, we, we split it into uh, regional distribution and local distribution. So the regional distribution fleet travels quite large distances with heavy payloads up and down the country. Um, that's at one end of the spectrum, difficult to see technical solutions in that area. Currently, for the local distribution vehicles, um, running in and out of the local factories, for example, the mileage and the journeys are much shorter. Um, but without conducting trials on specific vehicle type, it's difficult to see how much charge um, we would need in a vehicle to, to get it through the day so that it could come back to the depot for an overnight recharge. But for some of the lighter vehicles, definitely there are opportunities in that space. We've got a fleet of vehicles out collecting cars, for example, from uh, end-of-life vehicles from consumers, and certainly there are opportunities in that uh, area with current technology to, to look to, uh, to go down the electric route. And... Um, as was mentioned in the presentations, our fleet of company cars is uh, aim aiming to be fully electric. That's great. Thanks very much, Simon. And uh, we, I think we're pretty much at the... Uh, we've got one final question here, I think. Um, one for you, Ian. Um, we've talked a lot about the transition from road to rail, uh, but obviously that means that your yards need to be connected to rail. Uh, are you looking to increase the number of rail linked yards that you've got in the UK? No, that's a good question, Roger. Um, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. I, I think it's important um, to, to, to let the audience know that we already operate eight rail-linked sites, um, and the, the, the rail paths are underutilised at the moment. So we, we move as much material as we can from those eight sites, um, and they're, they're, major, they're major volume sites within our network to our own ports, but what's limited at the moment are paths into the UK steel makers. So we're, we're strongly trying to encourage that at the moment and um, you know, increase the amount of material we move domestically. Um, the other important thing to note is that we're speaking to other commodity players as well to see if we could make sense of dead legs on the transport, whether that be in aggregates or other commodities as well. So finding extra efficiencies that way. But the short answer is absolutely, but there's much more we can do with our existing network before we get to that point. That's great. Thanks very much, Ian. Well, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. But I really appreciate all those questions from, from the people that have been uh, joining us on this, this webinar today. 
this is a bit of an experiment for the amount we're wanting to engage more with our supply chain because really the only way that we can reduce our carbon impact really to net zero is for all the players in the supply chain to work together uh, that's on our, you know, our suppliers emr and our customers uh, and we're keen to to get everyone involved in working on this moving along this journey with us. Um, this is the first of our series. We've got a few more coming up. The next one is next Tuesday, the 5th of October at 11 o'clock. Uh, and there we're going to be talking about how we're reducing the carbon dioxide in, uh, impact of our operations. And um, we've got Scott Bambra, who's who runs our largest shredding site in Liverpool, and Anthony Marrett, who runs our really complicated uh, separation processes all around the UK. So two real experts on, on processing, along again with Ian and myself. So uh, please do uh, join that session next week, uh, 11 o'clock on the 5th. Uh, if you found this one interesting, please do tell your friends uh, and ask them to, to sign up for the next one. I think there'll be a copy of this uh, session available on our YouTube channel as well if you want to, to share it with anyone else. But really do appreciate you joining us this morning. We finished a little bit earlier than we, than we uh, scheduled because we wanted to give you some time back in your day today. So uh, thanks very much for your attention. I've been Roger Morton from EMR. Thanks very much for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.